The human brain is an incredibly sophisticated system, not unlike a high-tech computer. It is made up of countless interconnected parts that work together in specific patterns to generate our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Sometimes, the best way to understand how this intricate system operates is to study it when things go wrong. Since the establishment of psychiatry by French physician Philippe Pinel in 1790, the investigation of brain injuries, illnesses, and disorders has yielded invaluable insights into the workings of the human mind and brain. Disruptions to normal brain function provide a unique opportunity to observe the concrete biological changes that impact our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Thanks to recent technological advancements, researchers are able to delve deeper into the study of disordered minds than ever before. Through a synthesis of biology, psychology, and neuroscience, we can explore the lessons that autism teaches us about the social dimensions of the brain, how schizophrenia can inspire creativity, what Alzheimer's reveals about memory, and much more. This video offers a glimpse into some of the most significant findings of modern neuroscience, including the relationship between schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease, why addiction is a chronic condition, and the ways in which our subconscious minds govern our daily lives. As human beings, we all experience sadness, wild ideas, strange urges, and moments of anxiety, euphoria, or forgetfulness from time to time. But what happens when these ordinary mental experiences escalate and begin to disrupt our daily lives? This may indicate the presence of a mental disorder. Mental disorders like depression, schizophrenia, or dementia often involve an amplification of everyday thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. For instance, clinical depression can cause weeks or even months of debilitating sadness. The primary takeaway here is that abnormal brain function can teach us a lot about how brains function normally. Psychiatry, which is the medical study of mental disorders, was established by French physician Philippe Pinel in 1790. Pinel was the first to suggest that mental disorders have a physical basis. Today, we understand that all mental disorders are also brain disorders. Genetic defects, environmental factors, or injury can alter the brain's normal structure and functioning. These physical changes directly impact a person's thoughts, feelings, and behavior, providing valuable insight into how our brains operate. Before we delve deeper into this field of study, let's review some basics. The brain is composed of millions of specialized nerve cells called neurons that form intricate networks to transmit information between our brain, body, and senses, giving rise to our mental processes. Neurons communicate via electrical signals and chemical molecules called neurotransmitters. In many mental disorders, specific neuron networks become dysfunctional, hyperactive, or incapable of communication. Modern neuroscience employs cutting-edge scientific technologies to investigate why and how this occurs. For instance, scientists can manipulate certain genes in mice to study their effects on the brain. By using such animal models, We've learned that simple genetic disorders of the brain, such as Huntington's, are caused by a single mutated gene, while complex genetic disorders like depression involve multiple genes and environmental factors. In addition, brain imaging techniques enable neuroscientists to examine the brain's activity in real time. For instance, an fMRI measures changes in the concentration of oxygen in red blood cells to identify which parts of the brain are active at any given time. Thanks to these technologies, the study of brain disorders is shedding light on the healthy brain. It's intriguing to consider that, in a way, we all have the ability to read minds. As social creatures, our brains have developed the capacity to attribute thoughts and emotions to others almost instinctively. This ability, known as theory of mind, enables us to comprehend and anticipate the behavior of other individuals and efficiently navigate the social world. Most children have developed this ability by the age of three. However, individuals with autism may experience difficulty with this crucial aspect of human interaction. Autism is a developmental disorder that predominantly affects an individual's social and communication skills. Although it manifests in different forms and degrees of severity, most autistic individuals struggle to understand and respond to the thoughts and emotions of others, as well as to acquire language at an early age. 
they tend to prefer solitary activities and exhibit a heightened sensitivity to changes in their environment. These characteristics can often be traced back to differences in brain development. Studies have shown that certain brain regions responsible for processing emotions, language, communication and perception are disrupted in individuals with autism. These regions make up the social brain, as identified by Leslie Brothers of UCLA School of Medicine. The underdevelopment of social brain regions can result in difficulties for autistic individuals in developing a theory of mind, communicating with others, and recognizing human faces and movements. Brain imaging techniques have revealed that, for individuals with autism, watching a person walk is not much different from watching the hands of a clock. Conversely, watching human or human-like movement automatically activates the social brain in typically developing individuals. Thus, autism provides an opportunity to study the intricacies of the specialized social wiring of our brains. It reminds us of the deeply social nature of human beings and the remarkable ability to understand and anticipate the thoughts and emotions of others, which is essential for effective communication and interaction. Henry Malaisen, recognized by medical professionals solely as HM, stands as a paramount figure in the annals of neuroscience. His luck, however, was not on par with his significance. After a childhood bicycle mishap, HM encountered severe epilepsy in his adult years. In an effort to halt his seizures, physicians opted to excise the brain regions scarred by the accident. While the surgery promptly remedied HM's epilepsy, it came with a steep cost. HM retained long-standing memories of people and occurrences, but lost the ability to create new ones. Every fresh detail he acquired post-surgery was instantly forgotten. Intriguingly, researchers discovered that he could still pick up new motor skills, like drawing techniques, without retaining any memory of practicing them. HM's case exposed the brain's dual memory systems, a specific recollection system that accounts for remembering events and individuals, and an inherent recollection system that enables us to recall learned motor skills intuitively, like cycling or piano playing. The hippocampus, which was excised in HM, plays a crucial role in specific memory. The hippocampus is also impacted by the two most prevalent brain disorders affecting memory, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, resulting in the gradual deterioration of memory. Unlike in HM's case, the culprits here are misbehaving proteins, not daring doctors. Here's where things get intricate, but stay with us and you'll grasp the role of these proteins. Proteins, when healthy, fold into a distinct three-dimensional form. A protein's unique shape fits into certain brain receptors like a key in a lock, making it essential for proper function. In Alzheimer's and dementia, proteins misfold and begin to aggregate. These irregularly folded proteins are known as prions. These misshapen proteins initially emerge in the prefrontal cortex before eventually reaching the hippocampus, the center of specific memory. Initially, they cause a disconnect between neurons, and as the disease progresses, they eliminate neurons altogether. Memory disorders have shed light on the extensive impact minute alterations in the brain can have, but the identification of prions has also unlocked new potential treatment avenues for these conditions. Dementia and Alzheimer's aren't the sole neurological conditions rooted in misfolded proteins. The human brain contains numerous proteins, which means there are countless ways defective proteins can influence our cognition and actions. For example, Parkinson's and Huntington's diseases both involve misfolded proteins in the brain, progressively impairing an individual's mobility. When we're healthy, movement appears so innate that we tend to overlook the fact that our brains control our bodies. The motor system is composed of a distinct network of neurons that originate in the brain, extend down the spinal cord, and connect to each of the 650 muscles in our body. Some neurons transmit signals from the brain to the muscles to initiate movement, while others relay signals from the muscles back to the brain, providing feedback about the movement. Parkinson's disease interferes with the normal function of this signaling loop. The condition leads to a characteristic tremor and limited range of movement, typically manifesting around the age of 60. In 1817, a British doctor named Parkinson first described the disease, but due to its physical symptoms, it wasn't recognized as a brain disorder until much later. 
In the early 1900s, researchers found that a midbrain region called the substantia nigra, known for its distinct black pigmentation, was significantly lighter in color in the brains of individuals with Parkinson's compared to healthy brains. The substantia nigra houses neurons responsible for producing the neurotransmitter dopamine. Recall that schizophrenia is associated with excessive dopamine? In contrast, Parkinson's is linked to a dopamine deficiency. In Parkinson's disease, misfolded alpha-synuclein proteins obstruct the dopamine-producing neurons in the substantia nigra. Research using fruit flies has shown that the protein misfolds due to a spontaneous mutation on the SNCA gene, the origins of which remain uncertain. Initially, the substantia nigra neurons become hyperactive in an attempt to compensate for the decrease in function. However, they are eventually destroyed by protein clumps and can no longer produce dopamine. Dopamine is vital for muscle control, and its deficiency in Parkinson's results in the condition's hallmark tremor and a progressive reduction in movement speed and range. This gradual neuron loss in the substantia nigra also explains why the region is lighter in color in Parkinson's patients. In the past, even mental health experts assumed addiction boiled down to a matter of willpower. Why not simply quit a pleasurable yet destructive behavior that wreaks havoc on one's health and relationships? Today, neuroscience has shown us it's not that straightforward. Like other psychological conditions, addiction, whether to substances, alcohol, gambling, or food, fundamentally alters our brain. Primarily, it affects the systems responsible for pleasure, emotions, and behavior, virtually hijacking our ability to choose. The enormous burden of addiction costs the U.S. economy approximately $740 billion annually. The brain's dopamine reward system regulates the pleasure derived from food, sex, or drugs. This system encompasses dopamine-producing neurons in the substantia nigra, which reach deep into the hippocampus, amygdala, and striatum. Recall that the hippocampus plays a role in memory, while the amygdala governs basic emotions. Additionally, the striatum is a critical brain region for habit formation. Typically, the brain's reward system encourages the pursuit of pleasurable experiences, which involve the release of the feel-good chemical dopamine. For instance, when you eat a delicious banana, your brain releases a moderate amount of dopamine. Your brain stores this experience, and the next time you encounter a banana, you'll feel more inclined to eat it. The more dopamine released during an experience, the more driven your reward system becomes in seeking it out. Unsurprisingly, most addictive drugs and experiences elicit a stronger dopamine response than consuming a banana. Cocaine, for example, triggers a dopamine release while also directly interfering with its removal from the synapse, causing it to linger longer in the brain. The reward system not only learns to associate the drug with pleasurable dopamine release, but also the accompanying environments, people, and music. Consequently, for addicts, merely encountering someone associated with the drug can activate their brain's compulsive pleasure-seeking mode. To the best of our current knowledge, these pleasure associations remain in the brain indefinitely. This explains the high relapse rate among recovered addicts and why addiction is now considered a chronic disease. In numerous species, male and female animals display distinct behavioral differences, Although humans exhibit a broader range of gendered behaviors, we still follow this trend. Scientists have identified subtle structural and molecular variations in the brains of men and women. These gender-specific activity patterns appear in areas related to sexual and reproductive behaviors, as well as regions responsible for emotion, memory, and stress. The exact link between these patterns and thought and behavior remains unknown, but it seems sex and gender also manifest in the brain. The crucial point is that our bodies and brains accommodate diverse expressions of sex and gender identity. Firstly, it's important to distinguish between the sex assigned at birth based on external genitalia, male, female, or intersex, and gender identity. A person might have female genitalia but identify as a man. Additionally, there are actually three unique types of sex. Anatomical sex depends on external genitalia, typically a penis or a vulva. Gonadal sex relies on internal genitalia, such as ovaries and testes, which produce distinct sex hormones. Lastly, chromosomal sex refers to the sex chromosomes inherited from our parents. 
Two XX chromosomes usually result in a female anatomy, while an X and a smaller Y chromosome typically lead to a male anatomy. Anatomical development starts in the womb around the sixth or seventh week. If the fetus carries a Y chromosome, the SRY gene triggers testis formation. The testis then release a surge of testosterone, similar to levels during puberty, promoting male development. Without a Y chromosome, the fetus develops a female anatomy. Soon after birth, the body releases another wave of sex hormones, either testosterone or estrogen, that seem to influence the development of certain gender-specific brain patterns related to aggression and mating. For most individuals, anatomical, gonadal and chromosomal sex align with each other and their gender identity. However, since these characteristics develop at separate times, various disruptions and variations can occur. Some gene mutations, for example, cause a disconnect between anatomical sex and gonadal and chromosomal sex. Anatomical women with a congenital adrenal hyperplasia CAH, gene are exposed to higher levels of testosterone in the womb, typically found in anatomical boys. Consequently, a small yet significant portion of these women are bi or homosexual, and another notable segment identifies as trans men. But what about the most important thing? Human consciousness. One of the most enigmatic aspects of the brain's complex functions is consciousness. In plain terms, consciousness refers to our awareness of mental processes as they occur. When we're awake, experiences such as seeing a friendly face, smelling a rose, or feeling fear have a subjective quality we can later think and talk about. Here's the central point. Neuroscience is beginning to unlock the riddle of consciousness. Our overall consciousness level is connected to the brain's total level of alertness. For instance, our brains are more active when we're awake than when we're asleep, and least active during a coma. This consciousness level seems to be regulated by an area in the upper brain stem. When this region is damaged in mice, they enter a coma. However, when it's electrically stimulated, they awaken immediately. Neuroscientists are also investigating when specific mental experiences become conscious and which brain areas are involved in these experiences. So far, brain imaging findings seem to support the ideas of renowned psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud from the 19th century. Firstly, our minds are distinctly split into conscious and unconscious processes. Secondly, these unconscious processes have more impact on our thoughts motivations and behavior than we often recognize. To explain why certain mental experiences become conscious and others remain unconscious, cognitive psychologist Bernard Bars proposed the global workspace theory. According to this theory, the brain's deeper layers continuously process sensory information from our surroundings unconsciously. When we focus our attention on specific information, our brains detect the initial sensory signal and relay it to higher brain regions, making it accessible in the conscious global workspace. If an image is shown to us subliminally, meaning it appears too briefly for us to consciously identify or remember, the visual cortex at the back of the brain is highly active for 200 to 300 milliseconds before the signal fades. When the image is displayed long enough, the visual signal doesn't fade but is disseminated and amplified throughout the entire brain. Only then does the image enter the conscious global workspace there's still much for neuroscience to uncover regarding how our brains generate consciousness. However, with the help of new technologies and collaboration with psychology, psychiatry and biology, it may be possible to unravel the brain's most intriguing mystery. Thank you for watching to the end. Our channel needs to get 1,000 subscribers, so if you subscribe to our channel you'll help a lot. See you soon.